Towards a frameworkless world. A frameworkless world. How, how many people over the past two days, which have been a great two days, I'm sure you'll all agree, have been to a talk that was about a framework? Just set your hands up. I'm not going to make you stand up because you're all tired after two days. Um, keep, your, keep your hands up. Um, also, stick your hand up if you've worked on a project that used a framework this week. And join your hands so that any of those if you have a project in your company that uses a framework. So, I mean, I can't quite see everyone, but I'm pretty sure like most of the hands in the room are up. So, I'm here talking about a frameworkless world in a world that quite obviously has quite a few frameworks uh, that are obviously quite well used. So, uh, quickly, who am I? Uh, my name is Michael Callum, and that photo looks even more ugly than it normally does when it's that large. Um, that's my Twitter handle. If you want to tweet abuse at me, uh, if you want to tweet constructive criticisms, anything else during the talk, uh, that's where you can find me. I can't respond. I'm completely defenseless for the next 30 minutes, so there you go. I work for a company called Sam Knows. Um, we're hiring. We do cool stuff with data and APIs. Uh, come have a chat with me if you want to talk about that. I work on a project called PHP BB, uh, which is a fr uh, uh, forum software which you probably used about 150 years ago. Um, <laughs> you probably found like security issues with it and stuff. It's a bit better now. Um, Still a way to go. And I also am a secretary of the PHP FIG, um, which is a PHP Framework Interoperability Group. I'll mention it a bit briefly later. Um, but realistically, you don't care about any of that. You don't care about me. I'm just a guy on a stage. Um, we want, we're going to talk about frameworks. And because it's a keynote, everything has to be big and important. So we're going to talk about the PHP world. But it's a framework as well, so we'll make it dark. I like history. Who likes history? Who likes history but hated history when they were at school? Yeah, this, 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 will, this will be fun history, I promise. Um, but we're going to start off with a date, just like school. So, 1994. Uh, what happened in 1994? Nelson Mandela uh, became president, uh, was inaugurated as president of South Africa. Uh, China got the internet. That's, that's cool. Uh, that affects all of us, uh, especially those of us that have like websites that are currently used in China. This other kind of important thing happened. Um, it was kind of this guy's fault. I mean, I mean, this guy's success. Um, does anyone know who this guy's? Shout out. Rasmus, yes. Um, he created PHP, for anyone who doesn't know about it. Uh, Eli was talking yesterday about um, old schoolers and stuff. And in 1994, I can confess, I was one of those that he mentioned that wasn't actually born. Um, so. He created PHP as a tool so he could track visitors to his resume. Uh, I don't think he realized the effect it was going to have on his resume um, in the long run. But, you know, that happened. Uh, and we're all here today because of that. And we've come quite a long way. Um, this goes to 2018 because, you know, we're always forward thinking, right? Um, as developers, we're always thinking about what we're doing next, uh, except for like half the time. So we're over here, 2017, uh, PHP 3. Uh, over there in 1998. 1998 was when we had the Zend engine. Yeah, big whoop. Yeah, go on. Okay, that was pathetic. Uh, um, we can have a bigger whoop for this one, though. PHP 7 in 2015. There we go. That's much better. Um, so, we've come a long way. Who remembers PHP Lib in 1998? Like, I see like four hands, five hands, and I don't think that's just because I can't see any of you. Um, PHP Lib was kind of like the first framework. Uh, it, I recently tweeted out when I was working on this talk, I was like, who has a release date for the PHP Lib? Because I didn't know what year it was. And the response I got was from one of the initial guys who worked on it. And he sent me an email to the mailing list where it was kind of being announced. And basically, it was sessions handling. Um, yeah, I mean, not a huge amount, but realistically, in that day, that was a framework, right? It provided a couple of features that use a lot of applications. And we call that a framework, right? 2005, Symphony 1. Who used Symphony 1? Woo! OK, yeah. <laughs> OK, that's a fair enough reaction in Symphony 1. Um, that was kind of like the first proper framework. Um, you took this big thing called Symphony, and you built a project around it, 
and you had this big application that was called a Symfony application, and it did some horrible things, but it kind of gave you a structure to your application, and it meant that we could stop using all of those homegrown frameworks that we all started building ourselves. 2006, uh, who remembers CakePHP? Who still uses CakePHP? Okay, a few people. Uh, Coding Nighter? Um, I see my company has like, raised their hands. We don't, we don't use it anymore. Um, uh, and Zen Framework, Zen Framework. Who's used, who's used Zen Framework? Okay, but this was Zen Framework 1. Zen Framework 1 is very different to Zen Framework 2. Um, yeah, just like Symphony, Symphony 1, Symphony 2. And then there was kind of like a little lull for a couple of years, and then there was this framework uh, that I can never remember actually how to pronounce, although David, I think, is here. Do you want to shout it out? David? Okay, no, he's gone home, never mind. Long weekend. Um, and then we get to 2011, and this happens. This is ridiculous, just saying. So we have FuelPHP, we have uh, Aura, we have Lithium, we have Symphony 2, we have Laravel, all of these kind of pop up. Um, and we have Composer pop up. Now, Composer was initially created by uh, Geordi and Niels. Uh, Niels uh, used to be the lead, de uh, lead developer of PHP Ruby. And he initially created Composer because he was like, PHP Ruby, we need a way to do package management. We need a way that we can have all of these extensions and styles and they can all work together and depend on each other. Um, so he created, started working on Composer and then he had a chat with Fabian uh, Potentier, the lead developer of Symphony at uh, Symphony Live. And Geordi was there, and Geordi was like, hey, I can help out with this, because Symphony is having a similar problem. Does anyone remember you used to have that depths file in Symphony? Yeah, that was kind of ugly, right? So we solved that problem, and uh, PHRV implemented Composer this year, so we took kind of a long time after we then invented it. Um, but yeah, so huge advent of frameworks in 2011. And then in 2012, two things happened. We had an, one extra framework, Falcon, um, and we had the PHP Frig. Uh, it was uh, in, uh, initially created the first ever meeting of the PHP Frig. Um, I'll talk a bit more about what that is in a minute. But then there's nothing. There is nothing between 2012 and I'm going to say 2018 because I'm hoping none of you are going to invent a framework in the next 10 minutes. Although if someone goes and like, writes one now and proves me wrong, then obviously you didn't pay attention to the whole frameworkless bit. Um, but so we have we have this big lull here and my, my, my thing is not working, so that's not helpful. Um, between 1994 and 2005, we had no frameworks. We lived in a frameworkless world. Well, we had pitch relib, whatever. Then we had a lull, because we had some stuff in 2005, 2006. Then we had all of this in 2011. It was like, yay, we have Composer, we have libraries, we have all of this stuff we can include, it's great. And then nothing again. So did every PHP developer just stop developing PHP at that point? Obviously not, because we're all still here. Packagist. So if we look back to kind of 2012 when Packagist started, um, this is uh, an exponential graph, essentially. It's not very smooth. Uh, everyone likes a smooth graph, but like, they never really are, are they? Um, a ridiculous number of installs. You can't read these numbers down here, but it says basically 4 million packages installed. And if uh, we look at the number of Symfony downloads, that's now almost 700 million downloads. If we look at Zen Framework, that's about 150 million downloads. If we look at Laravel, that's 30 million downloads. So that means that 18% of all downloads from Packagist are Symfony. 18%. That's ridiculous. If we include Zen Framework and Laravel in that number, that number is 24%. That's, that's a quarter of all downloads of packages are frameworks. So frameworks are a big deal, which puts me in a problem because I submitted an abstract to this conference and the talk title was Towards a Frameworkless World. Um, so where does this leave us? What if I told you that frameworks weren't actually frameworks? I, I, I found a fix for this. I, found, I worked out how we're in a frameworkless world. Because frameworks aren't frameworks. If you look at the Symfony top downloaded packages, this comes from their website. Um, and they pull that from, from Composer, so uh, from Packages API, rather. So I, tr I, trust, I trust these numbers uh, as much as I can. Although, realistically, those numbers will be slightly off because they did like zip downloads at the beginning of their time. So, but we can, we, can, we, can, we can roll with this. 
So we've got like Event Dispatcher, we've got Console, we've got YAML, Finder, Process, blah, 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 all of these different components. Symfony itself, the actual Symfony framework, is 15th. 15th. It's kind of low, right? Framework bundle is like not even on that, the top few. If I look at Zend, it's kind of the same. They're seventh. But, you know, it's, it's still not the top. The, the framework is not the most downloaded part of the framework. Um, and if we look at Aura and Laravel, then it's kind of a similar kind of solution. Laravel is a, bit, um, is a lot less componentized uh, in the way that it kind of operates as a layer. But it's, even that is the same. If you look at all the downloads of all the different Laravel components, they're actually more than Laravel itself. And if you look at Aura, that's very componentized. So if we actually look at the number of downloads of those actual frameworks, of the Symfony framework, of Zend framework, of Laravel, we end up with 35 million. Now, considering I was talking about uh, 900 million just a few moments ago, 900 million downloads for frameworks, and now we're talking about 35 million. That's tiny. We all feel like we're using frameworks, but actually it turns out we're really not. This, this uh, bar chart on the left, uh, this bit just, that bit down there, that's frameworks out of all downloads on Packagist. And on the right-hand side, we have all of these other libraries, these components of frameworks. Because we libraried all the things. Because everyone loves a library, right? Who, who likes a library? Who likes a library with books? How does, how, how at a tech conference does that get a bigger whoop? <laughs> anyway, um, I, I love books too. Like, yeah, so I, I get it, I get it. But we libraried all the things. We, we, we like libraries. And the reason for that is that frameworks aren't frameworks. Yay, I found my solution. Your application should have three things in it. It should have your business logic, libraries, and glue. Nothing else. Nothing. Who thinks that they have something else in one of their applications that's not one of these three things? You're wrong, and I can say that because I'm on stage and you're not. However, feel free to come and like, dis dispute that with me later. I'm just going to say that for the sake of it. I'm actually curious as to what your actual thing is. So business logic, what the hell is business, business logic? Your business logic is the stuff that actually matters to your application. That's saying that if we want this, speci we want this specific endpoint at this specific URL, we can do this thing um, and output this kind of data, um, and we can send this thing to cache. But the thing is, is that we don't actually put it in the cache. We tell Monolog to put it in a login library, or we tell Symfony Cache to cache it. That's done by libraries. So libraries is all of your technical stuff. That's stuff that does stuff. Um, that's things like Monolog. But also, it's things like internal tools that quite often you'll end up accidentally integrating into your business logic, because you're only ever going to need it in that one place. If you're persisting stuff to a cache, if you're persisting stuff to a file system, if you're retrieving stuff from a file system, if you're doing your uh, processing a request, Symphony request, Symphony response in HTTP kernel foundation, that's a library. It's not a framework. And then finally, we have our glue. And this is basically what a framework is. A framework is glue. A framework is glue between all of these different components. It's a glue between your event dispatcher, your container, your caching library. And not all of that is part of your framework bundle in your vendor directory. Um, sometimes that's your configuration in your YAML files, or if you're slightly insane, or your XML files and annotations, if you're slightly less insane. Um, that's a bit opinionated, but. So, and it's also about your structure, your structure of your application. You know, do you have a source directory, do you have an app directory? That's all kind of glue. So, and this is, this is a word I made up, by the way. This is not a typo. Um, if you're being library agnostic, I reckon that we should say, we should say that this is library agnotism. Um, so I'm inventing this word, because uh, I feel like it. Um, library agnotism, what does that mean? It means that you can swap out a library during development. Uh, that's solid principles, right? Everyone follows since solid principles. Everyone likes solid. Solid is solid. Um, Dependency and version principle says that you should depend on abstractions and not concretions. So you should be able to swap out libraries. You shouldn't be depending on a specific library. Uh, you can use the tools that work for the job. Instead of saying, hey, I'm just going to use Symfony, or hey, I'm just going to use Zen Framework, you can do what Drupal do, because Drupal are doing good things right now. And you can use a bit of Zen Framework, and you can use a little bit of Symfony. 
That's perfectly fine if that's what does the job. And you can drop in replacements. So Gary, who did a, uh, a keynote yesterday uh, in the afternoon, he told me a story a little while back, I think it was at PHP World, and he said that he disliked Symfony's uh, container, or uh, disliked Pimpleware, rather. Um, that's perfectly fine, that's an opinion. Uh, he, well, he didn't even necessarily dislike it, he just prefers Zend, which is cool, because he is the lead maintainer of Zend's service container, so it kind of makes sense, he's slightly biased. But it means that when he goes and uses a micro framework or whatever, um, if it's implementing certain interfaces, he can just drop in whatever he feels like. But then you kind of get this thing called dependency hell. Who has dependency hell? Quite a few of you. If you don't have dependency hell, you probably do, and Composer just solves it for you. Um, you can have library one, and it can say, hey, I require monolog, symphony cache, and pimple. And you can have library two, and it say, hey, we require klog, a stash, and Zen framework. Library three says, hey, I want analog PHP cache and PHP lead container, and then your business logic has a completely different set of requirements. And that's hard. Um, so we develop interfaces, and we say that all of these different libraries, if they implement these interfaces, then you're not depending on monolog anymore. You're just depending on three things, three interfaces. And those different libraries can implement them however they need to, um, and provide that additional functionality that might be appropriate for your use case, because you should be using what is relevant to you and not just whatever a certain library forces you to use. I don't, I don't want my caching library to dictate my logging library. I want to dictate my logging library. So we go from 10 dependencies to just three, which I chose. I call myself a Symfony developer, so I went for Symfony cache and Symfony dependency injection container. You can do whatever you like. So I said I'd mention the fig very briefly. What is the fig? Uh, it's kind of a bit like the PHP Congress. Um, this is uh, a photo of uh, Obama speaking at the PHP Congress. Um, this, 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 this totally happened uh, about three years ago. Um, yeah, so it even says like in PHP we trust at the top. So yeah, PHP Congress. What, I, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? So PHP Congress, it's a bunch of people that come together, to come together representing different parts of the PHP ecosystem. Uh, and whether that's from different projects, uh, you can call them states if you want, and also from the community uh, with the new Fig3 and you can elect community re representatives. It's also a bit like the UN, because you know, we argue a lot, uh, we don't disagree on things, uh, we don't agree, always agree on things. Um, but the idea is it's designed to represent this huge, diverse group of people, of huge, diverse group of different projects. Um, it's called the PHP Framework Interoperability Group, which, of course, is a problem because I just said we're in a frameworkless world. So just pretend it's like a standards group or an interoperability group. So I was talking about those different PSRs or interfaces that we could be moving over to, and that sounds for PHP standards recommendation. And a lot of them are interfaces. Um, some of them do other things, um, but I don't really care about them in this talk. So. These interfaces, they're great, right? They allow for, and there's that word again, uh, framework agnosticism. And this is really important because we're no longer a Symfony application or a Zen framework application or a Laravel application. We're PHP applications. And we're just having, you know, might be the choice that you, a bunch of Symfony components work for you. I, I said earlier that Symfony cache and Symfony dependency injection worked for me. So I pulled in those two, those two different things. That doesn't mean that I've got a Symfony application. I have a PHP application that uses Symfony. If I decided to then pull in the Zen service container, I'm not suddenly using a Zen framework application. I just happen to be doing that. This applies to people too. Uh, who in the room describes himself as a Symfony developer, a Zen framework developer, a Laravel developer? Yeah, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to say that I, if you look at my Twitter bio, I'm pretty sure it probably says I'm a back-end Symfony developer. Um, I work a lot with Symfony. Um, but I, after this talk, I should definitely go change that. Because I, as a developer, should become framework agnostic as well as my applications. Ultimately, the, the framework, all that is, is your glue. And your glue should be up to you. Focus on the libraries that you're using. Focus on your business logic because that's really what you care about. Your applications, if you make these completely framework agnostic, that's not really a thing. 
because you still have your glue in your applications, right? Your glue is still really important. Your glue is what brings your application together. But it shouldn't really matter what your glue actually really is. Your libraries. If you're developing a library, then why develop a library for Symfony when you could develop a library for every single framework? And then just have glue packages, have a bundle for Symfony, have a service provider for Laravel. You can, someone can just drop into their project. Immediately, you've just stopped having 30 million people from being able to use your project and had a few hundred million. And finally, yourselves. If you can make yourselves more framework agnostic, then it means you're a lot more versatile. If you go into a new job and you suddenly have to start using a new framework, that's great. But I think we should actually bear in mind the fact that we're just not Symfony developers. We're not Zen Framework developers. We're all just PHP developers. Matthew Werofini, um, great guy. Uh, Gary also spoke his praises yesterday. He created a blog post, uh, which you can go and find actually down here. And he made this quote. Um, he was talking about Composer and having lots of different packages. And he said, the logical implica implication of Composer is the ability to package reusable web-focused widgets that can be composed into applications. Now, it's a very long-winded way of saying that why do we have to have a Symfony bundle? Why do we have to have a Laravel bundle? Why can't we just have a whole bunch of libraries and build our applications? Because as developers, that's what we do. We build applications. We don't build Symfony applications. We don't build Zen Framework applications. We don't care about that. We don't need to. Thank you very much.